For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Welcome everyone. Today I will be featuring a tale from Ramon Mundo Mendoza's autobiography, Mexican Mafia, The Gangs of Gangs, from Alta Border Hitman. If you are interested in purchasing this book, please click on the link in the description and it will take you directly to the Police and Fire Publishing website. Mundo operated as an undercover informant against his former brothers in the Mexican Mafia while working with the prison gang task force for 14 harrowing months. During this time, he knew that any little slip-up or perception of weakness could lead to his execution for being an informant or not taking care of him at business. Mundo was placed between a rock and a hard place many times during these 14 months. Mundo and his crime partner, Eddie Sailorboy Gonzalez, spent 18 and 16 months respectively locked up in the Kern County Jail fighting two counts of murder for the execution of Nuestra Familia member Daniel Woodsy Reyes and his brother Ronald Reyes on October the 9th, 1975 in Bakersfield, California. When Mundo paroled from CDC in the summer of 1975, he asked his contacts in Bakersfield to locate three individuals he earmarked for execution. The first was Ralph Pata Garcia, a Mexican Mafia defector. The second was Gonzalo Charlo Hernandez, one of the founders of the Nuestra Familia. And the third was Daniel Woodsy Reyes. Mundo targeted Woodsy for disrespecting Cheyenne's memory after Cheyenne was murdered on December the 17th, 1971, in Chino's Palm Hall. This is the same Woodsy Reyes that sparked the 1970 war between the Mexican Mafia and the Nuestra Familia by refusing to yield to the inmate in a dispute over an inmate homosexual money earner. Cyclona Perez, the sister of MM member Raymond Chavo Perez, located Woodsy and gained entry into his home. This was the first execution where a street gang member and a female participated in a Mexican Mafia execution. On January the 13th, 1977, the case against Mundo and Sailor Boy was dismissed due to a technicality, specifically the denial of a speedy trial. The California Penal Code provides for dismissal of any charge when a defendant is not brought to trial in a superior court within 60 days after finding of the indictment or filing of the information or within 90 days after notice of writ or order is filed in the trial court and served upon the prosecuting attorney in any case where the district attorney chooses to resubmit the case for a preliminary examination. Sailor Boy was the first to be released on January the 25th, 1977, after spending 474 days in the Kern County Jail. Deputy District Attorney Clarence Westra argued the previous day that further consideration should be given before releasing the two hitmen. Defense attorneys argued that the Kern County Courts no longer held authority over their clients due to the judge's dismissal of all charges on the grounds that they were denied a speedy trial. Furthermore, a 10-day stay appeal to the 5th District Court of Appeals had expired two days prior. On March 4, 1977, the teletype arrived informing Kern County Sheriff's Department of Mundo's discharge from parole. He exited the lobby and crossed the parking lot towards the Greyhound station. Then he noticed a blue Plymouth alongside of him. Gil Chili Avila from the prison gang task force and Mundo's soon-to-be handler said, Don't look at us. Keep walking towards the bail bonds office across the railroad tracks. We will meet you behind the building. That is how his life as an undercover informant began. Some people have speculated that Mundo turned against his former brothers because he was in trouble with the Mexican Mafia or the law, but this was not the case. The two Bakersfield murder charges had just been dismissed and he was discharged from parole. Furthermore, a Mexican Mafia member demonstrates his loyalty to his brothers and the Mexican Mafia by killing for them and the organization. Both inside and outside of prison, Mundo made it his mission to be involved in, in as many murders as possible. He had a proven record of murder and was in high standing. The fellas confirmed his standing in the Emin when they agreed that he should assume control of the Mexican Mafia's heroin, heroin distribution operation from Robert Robot Salas upon his release from the Kern County Jail. I clarify this not to defend Mundo's actions, but because otherwise is to deny the miracle that the Lord Jesus Christ, the King of Kings, granted him by extending his grace to Mundo and saving him from internal hell. Initially, Mundo did not see the benefit in taking over the image drug operation, because while Mundo was in the Kern County Jail, Robot experienced two arrests while holding heroin instead of securing it in mafia stash pads. Robot would be convicted of gun and drug charges in one case and be sentenced to 5 to 15 years 
and the charges in the second arrest were dismissed since the search warrant that enabled the police to confiscate 18 ounces of heroin was invalidated. This led directly to their Mexican drug connection, Jesus Chuy Arajo, suspending heroin deliveries until the heat died down. Robot had left Mundo with an empty bag. However, the more Mundo thought of this, the more he liked the idea. Mundo hoped to be insulated from the hit detail and the violence as the man in charge of the bag. He would be the middleman between George Morgan, who was in hiding at this time, and the brothers on the street. In this role, Mundo would be privy to sensitive information that he could feel to Gil and the prison gang task force. Mundo told Gil that this would be a full-time job and asked if he would receive a salary for his efforts. Gil quickly explained that the prison gang task force could not provide him with a salary since he was not a police officer. That type of arrangement could result in legal problems for future prosecutions down the road. There was a small payment provided for information, but no salary. Mundo then asked, then how about if I get involved in the distribution of heroin? He explained to Gil that he needed to be involved in Mexican Mafia business in some capacity to maintain his cover. Gil understood this, and Mundo said, I'm not going to pull any more triggers, so why don't you guys make sure I don't catch any heat while I'm dealing dope? Gil considered his request and stared at Mundo intently and said, Listen to me, Mundo. I cannot give you a license to commit a crime, any crime, and that has to be our official position. I can also tell you that none of us will be looking at you very closely because we'll have our hands full with your mafia brothers. Mundo read between the lines and thought he had it all figured out. Being, in, being the man in charge of the Mexican mafia's heroin distribution, he hoped would insulate him from the mafia's other business, while he funneled information to the prison gang task force, but he would be proven wrong. In October 1977, Mundo visited his mom's home in East LA while she vacationed in Mexico. He was sitting in the living room enjoying a bucket of Kentucky Fried Chicken when he noticed someone approaching the house. Through the screen door, Mundo saw Robot and Gilbert Shotgun Sanchez, also known as Escopetón, but they could not see him. Before Robot had a chance to knock on the door, Mundo invited them in. Robot teased Mundo in his usual way by suggesting he jog a few miles to get rid of the spare tire that was beginning to form. He looked down and frowned. Mundo was in good shape, or so he thought. Shotgun was his normal surly self. They were reluctant to discuss Emmett business in Mundo's mother's home out of respect. This was out of character for Shotgun, but Mundo appreciated the courtesy. He suggested they go to his apartment in Pico Rivera since his youngest sister was arriving home from work anytime soon. Mundo had two residences. His official residence was at his mother's home for the purpose of parole, and Mundo utilized his second undisclosed residence to conduct Emmett business away from the prying eyes of his parole officer. As soon as they entered Mundo's apartment, Shotgun unleashed and asked why Chuy was taking his time getting them resupplied with heroin. If Daniel Dangerous Dan Diavila was still on the lista, and if anyone was able to locate Maruca so that she may be executed as well. Mundo assured them that Joe was working on it. In the meantime, Robot and Shotgun were looking for a quick score. The conversation turned to drug connections not connected to the Mexican Mafia that they could rip off. Without thinking, Mundo suggested Poncho from White Fence. He had no business arrangement with the inmate. As soon as the words left his mouth, he cursed himself silently. Here he was, an undercover informant and born-again Christian, serving up Poncho to Robot and Shotgun. Shotgun became excited and paced back and forth, snapping his fingers with that familiar lunatic smile on his face. Shotgun said, that's Pachi's compadre. Mundo feigned ignorance. Alfonso Apache Alvarez, age 40, paroled from Folsom Prison in June of 1971 after serving more than four years on a sentence for possession and sale of marijuana. Pachi, short for Apache, engaged in the Mexican Mafia's early attempts to utilize community organizations aimed at helping paroled felons and drug addicts as fronts for their criminal activity. He was the founder of La Raza por los Pintos, the people for the prisoners. On December 9, 1971, Ernest Kilroy Royball and Alfred Alfie Sosa murdered Pachi behind the restrooms at Garvey Ranch Park on orders of Rudy Cheyenne Cadena. He was shot three times in the head for failing to fulfill his commitment to organize an escape attempt for Richard Mosca Solis and other members. Mosca subpoenaed high-ranking carnales from both Folsom Prison and San Quentin to his trial in San Bernardino for stabbing a guard at Chino Prison. The brothers were supposed to serve as character witnesses in Mosca's defense, but it was a ruse to attempt an escape. 
Pachi was tasked to organize the escape from the courthouse, but it failed to materialize. Pachi was rocked to sleep and even utilized to carry out the Emma's first street execution when he murdered James Chapel St. Clair, November the 5th, 1971, while Chapel was on a 24-hour pass from Chino Prison. Unfortunately for Pachi, the Emma's second street execution was his murder. Poncho was Pachi's compadre, and he attempted to hire hitmen to retaliate against the Emma. But the men that he solicited knew who the mafia was and did not want any trouble with them. Instead, they told the mafia about the contract. This led to the Emma placing Poncho on the lista for execution. Mundo asked Shagan why none of the other brothers had hit Poncho. Shagan stated he did not know, but they could kill two birds with one stone. By executing Poncho, they could fulfill the contract and robbing him of his drugs and money would satisfy the need for a quick score while they waited for Chui to resume the heroin supply. Mundo tried to extricate himself from the situation by suggesting they, sh they should case out the Poncho's home for a few days before they moved on him. Shotgun was undeterred and wanted to carry out the murder the same night. He asked Mundo how many pieces he was holding. It was common knowledge to the brothers that Mundo furnished firearms upon request for conducting Emma business. Mundo grabbed a suitcase from the bedroom closet and opened it, displaying a sawed-off shotgun and two handguns. He continued to try to find a way out. Mundo chose his words carefully, not wanting to appear weak or scared because that could lead to him being executed as well. Mundo cautioned that it was risky and unnecessary to take weapons without first casing out the home to determine if Poncho was even there. Furthermore, he added, Poncho had a wife and a house full of eight daughters. Mundo advised them to isolate Poncho to avoid witnesses and collateral damage, which was standard operating procedure when conducting a hit. Shotgun continued to be unmoved by Mundo's words and insisted they take the guns, and if they found Poncho, they would move on him. He volunteered to drive Robot's car with the guns and suggested Robot ride with Mundo in his car. Mundo looked to Robot for support, but not wanting to show weakness or fear, Robot went along with Shotgun. They packed the guns in a small suitcase and Shotgun loaded them into the trunk of Robot's rented Datsun. Robot instructed Shotgun to follow him and Mundo. As they drove to Poncho's home in El Sereno, Mundo's head was spinning. He found himself trapped. Here he was, an undercover informant, on the way to an execution with two notorious Mexican Mafia killers. Either Mundo participated in the murder or he too would be sent to Brazil. More than likely, innocent family members would be home and they too would become collateral damage. Suddenly, a cold shiver ran down Mundo's spine and a familiar calm came over him. He decided on a plan on how to proceed. If Poncho were home alone, he would allow Robot and Shotgun to execute Poncho since they did not take all three of them. Afterward, Mundo would call Gil and inform him of the events. If Poncho was not home alone, he would make certain to select the sawed-off shotgun and kill both Robot and Shotgun to preserve the lives of the innocent. The more Mundo thought of it, the better he felt about the prospects of blowing away his brothers. On the way to El Sereno, Shagan made a brief stop at his brother's home and picked up a small bag and another handgun. Shagan was in such a hurry to get to Poncho's home that he failed to secure the gun in the trunk with the other weapons. Instead, he got into the vehicle with it. Robot and Mundo were driving on Huntington Drive, headed towards Hillsdale Street, when Shagan suddenly sped up and passed him. At the corner of Huntington Drive and Lock Street, Shagan made a quick right turn without stopping. Police already had a vehicle stopped on Lock Street and waved Shotgun over. He complied and pulled over to the curb. Robot and Mundo cursed Shotgun's recklessness aloud. Mundo did so more for Robot's benefit. He truly felt relieved. There would be no murders, at least not today. They drove past Shotgun and parked a safe distance away to observe the scene. Once they saw a second black and white arrive and the Dotson's trunk open, Robot and Mundo knew it was time to make their getaway. Once the officer pulled over Shotgun, he observed a handgun on the floorboard of the car. This was the handgun that Shotgun picked up from his brother's home en route to Poncho's home. After a further search of the vehicle, the police found the two handguns and the sawed-off shotgun in the trunk. The Lord was pulling all the right strings for Mundo. Shotgun was charged with possession of a firearm by an ex-convict, possession of a sawed-off shotgun, and possession of stolen property when it was discovered that one of the guns in the car was stolen in an East L.A. burglary. Shotgun's impatience saved his and Robot's life. Shotgun would later argue that Mundo had set the whole thing up once he learned that he was cooperating with the prison game task force. This is one of the many accounts of murder and mayhem captured in Mundo's autobiography, 
Mexican Mafia, the Gangs of Gangs from Multiple Border Hitmen. And if you are interested in learning more, you may click on the link in the description and it will take you to the Police and Fire Publishing website where you may purchase this book. I will highlight other PFP books in the future, but for now, good night and God bless.